First he went to the school hill. Then he went to the Susquehanna. Mm. Then their people went to the Ohio. Every time the whites came right after them, took their land. And only when the Indians finally realized there was no way out of this, they were going to have nothing, is when they attacked. And that's when the Mennonites tell the story, when the attacks start. So, John Ruth, you spent quite a number of years researching Anabaptist history, and you just published another book. You, well, you've published quite a few books over the years. Uh, there's a new one, relatively new, that came out called This Very Ground. And it tells a side of the Mennonite story that I have never heard before, and I think is maybe you know part of our story that's ooh, not, not as good and um, something that we haven't heard about that much. And I really want to get into that today because I'm guessing it'll be a bit of a surprise to some people. So first off, thank you for coming on the podcast this evening. And why don't we start with just an overview of what what is the book about and what did you find in your research? Well, it, I began uh, asking the question of why I lived where I lived uh, in a beautiful spot along a creek named a branch of the Perkyoman Creek mm. in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, uh, 29 miles north of Philadelphia. And uh, I realized that when I was little, I liked to play at being Indian. I had a bow and arrow, mm. and I heard about the Indians, and I found that some of my friends went through phases where they enjoyed imagining themselves as Indians too. Mm. But it hit me wrong. Mm. Uh, I was with a conservative Mennonite bishop in Lancaster County when I was writing their uh, history, oh, 20 years ago, maybe, and he pointed to a field of corn where the corn stalks were so close together and thick that you could only harvest in low gear with good equipment. Mm. He pointed toward that field, and I don't know why he said this, but he said to me, look at that, he said. God got no glory when just the Indians were here. Hmm. And, uh, hmm, hmm. So God could wait all those thousands of years until we got here. And I remembered at harvest services, the, we would always quote that verse, uh, from the Psalms that the Lord has uh, given us into the lap of, uh, I just forget the, 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 the word lap, uh, of, uh, of um, luxuriant uh, herbage and fields. Mm. And uh, then I thought, <clears throat> well, who were those people? Because on the farm next to ours, they picked up hundreds of beautifully shaped points. Somebody had to get very good. Mm. And I had a neighbor who found 600 of those points in one field. Like ar arrowheads? Yes, yeah. well, we call them arrowheads. They were, and there were, uh, there were um, uh, other, other tools that you could hoe. And mm. uh, um, the more I thought about that was, in Columbus's uh, 500th anniversary of Columbus's landing in the Azores came, I thought, you know, we as Mennonites lived on this land. We ought to say something. Mm. 500 years, you shouldn't let that go past without saying anything. So uh, I thought, well, I wound up in Oklahoma where our Indians got to eventually, mm. and I just walked out on the street and asked somebody, could you give me some, tell me to somebody, take me to somebody that, uh, this is about, I don't know, 2000 or something like the year 2000. Mm. Uh, what would I have been, 70 years old already? Mm. And and they lent me, they led me to a, a couple, a Lenape couple. Mm. The Lenapes were the uh, uh, indigenous people who lived in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware. They're called Delawares, but that's an European name mm -hmm. because they 
had a group there. Mm. The Delawares are the same as the Lenapes. Well, well, anyway, we brought this couple up for October 12, 1992, which was the 500th anniversary. And um, we uh, took them to several churches and had them talk about themselves. And uh, I took them to a place where they were still finding Jasper points. Mm. And uh, then we went to a big celebration in the National Cathedral in Washington, where the sound of powerful drums, they celebrated Columbus Day. And the more I talked, well, what had happened then? A group of Indian, of Lenapis, took a walk along the so-called uh, walking purchase. I don't know if you ever heard that term, of 1737, when the last of our Lenape Indians gave, gave up their land. Hmm. 1737, you 1737. Said? And they were markers along the path of that walking hmm. purchase. Hmm. And when we, when we got to one of them, the group I was with of Indians or interested people became angry and mm. began shaking their rattles and spitting and yelling. And I said to myself, what's that, what's that feeling coming from? What's that about? Mm. It's not over in their minds, the loss of their land. And uh, then the, I kept thinking and thinking and thinking. Mm. And it drove me then finally to go into Philadelphia to the uh, uh, Historical Society of Pennsylvania and pull out actual documents and just sit there and read them. Mm. Now, on, I'm a latecomer to this, mm. honestly. I'm not a historian. And there, for 50 years, had been a growing accumulation real, uh, of scholarly work mm. on indigenous people. And we are in a peak of a profuse publication of scholarship Mm. on the indigenous people and what they actually said and where they actually live and what process mm. was proceeded through by which they were de-legalized uh, from the land that they had lived mm. on. Mm. It, it's very from much fermenting now. There's all kinds of societies. All kinds of people are interested in this. I'm a latecomer mm. uh, and non, a non-expert. All I asked was the land that mm. I live on, what was its story? Why am I living here fishing, swimming, skating, boating, trapping, farming, eating, born? My mom ate the eggs and the dandelion and the chicken, and I was born, formed in her womb. Mm. Out of this, why don't I go to think about earlier stages? Why am I so preoccupied with my decade? that I, that's a, is a blank in my mind. Mm. I, I felt starved. So anyway, mm. uh, I found that I was just a latecomer and just an amateur where professionals had been working even at the university level for years. Mm. And so I drew on their scholarship. Mm. In addition to going down to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and reading through the uh, legal records there. Mm. And what I wanted to know was, what was it like for those people to leave? When did they leave? Where did they go? And uh, what was their experience? Now they're in what we call Indian, uh, Oklahoma was Indian territory. That's where you went when you couldn't go any further. When you, where you couldn't stay in Ohio, you couldn't stay in Illinois, you couldn't stay in Missouri, Kansas, you had to go to Indian territory and there you were. Well, I made contact with them because there was a Mennonite uh, a minister who was also a, uh, uh, a Navajo, I, not Navajo, I forget, Cheyenne, Lawrence Hart. And he had a big to-do in the year 2006 in which he uh, invited people to listen to their story where our General Custer, who came from Mennonite background where I live, Wait, wait, General Custer came from Mennonite background? Yes, his ancestry was Mennonite, and he himself could speak Pennsylvania Dutch. Wait, I've never heard that. 
No. Can can we divert a little bit and hear a bit of that? Like what? How close was he connected to the Mennonites? Well, he wasn't connected anymore. You know, like mm -hmm. you can have Mennonite ancestry five generations ago and have no gen memory of it yourself. But it was probably closer than that for him, wasn't it? Uh, about four. Four I'd generations. Say, yeah. That's but anyway, wild. Okay. He, he led the attack. Yeah. At, at there that killed Black Kettle. Mm -hmm. who was the predecessor of Lawrence Hart. And anyway, as I put these uh, factoids together, mm -hmm. uh, I began to have feelings about it. And so it fueled my curiosity. Can we know anything? Mm -hmm. And I found it, sure you can. <laughs> uh, scholars had been right, but my story wasn't told. So mm -hmm. here's what I found, that when the people that settled my acreage, the Clemenses, living from the Palatinate, came, who came over in the year 1709. Mm -hmm. On that boat was a letter, a small letter, by William Penn, who was an old, disappointed man, but who had known Mennonites over the years. Really? Yes, he had. I didn't know that either. Well, no, we don't. We don't get that story. He had known Mennonites since seventeen, um, and in fact, he probably had Mennonite relatives in the, in, in southern Germany. But be left that aside. Whoa! He had visited Mennonites and worshipped with them in seventeen, uh, in uh, sixteen seventy seven. Really? In the Palatinate, yes. He knew Mennonites in Germantown. He knew Mennonites in Heidelberg. He knew Mennonites in Amsterdam. The sophisticated wow. Dutch, the uh, 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 hobnailed boots on the farms of the Hofs in the Palatinate, uh, who the Swiss refugees that came. He knew, he knew. And in this letter, which was not in the three-volume sophisticated uh the collection of his correspondence, I found it otherwise, and I found the original in the archives in Philadelphia. In this letter. Oh, the he original. Wrote, okay. He wrote to his um, uh, his secretary in Philadelphia, herewith come the Palatines, diverse Mennonists. Uh, diverse? He already knew we were different kinds. <laughs> oh, yeah, wow. You see, from 1663... When the first Mennonites came to uh, Germantown mm -hmm. to, six, to 1708, they could not have communion because they came from five different places over there. They weren't <laughs> united. Okay. So the first, the first ad, uh, adjective that William Penn used to, to tell his American, uh, his secretary about Mennonites was diverse. But the rest was complimentary. He mm. said, they are a sober people. Mm who will ne neither fight nor swear. Treat them with tenderness and love so that they will send over a good character. He wanted more of us. Ah. Undocumented. All he knew was we were Mennonites. Mm. And I, when, when I hear him talking about immigrants today, how terrible they are, they're all, they're all rapists and stuff like that, and a, f a fear of men, why people couldn't even talk English either. Hmm. And they had lost their their properties at home. That's why they had traveled up to the Palatina. Hmm. Well, anyway, when I saw that William Penn on that boat was the couple that settled the ground that I grew out of. Hmm. They got a hundred six hundred ninety acres. And I grew out of that, and that hmm. that still that formed me. That DNA is still there, and. Only by curiously pushing and pushing did I get to that story. Well, I got there. Mm -hmm. And I read, afterward, read the work of sophisticated historians, and I was shocked at how little I knew that they knew, already knew, but I didn't know my own story. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, that, that's what pushed me. Now, when I had to do that, I said, I got to learn work. Gerhard Clemens came from, and I have to know, I found out that his father-in-law, Hans Stauffer, was born in Switzerland mm -hmm. in the same year that William Penn was born in London. So I've got a narrative. 
a mm. twin narrative. Let's follow Penn, and let's follow Gerhard Clemens, but let's put an Indian right beside him. What were they experiencing when my people were rejoicing in the new uh, acreage and, and the woods and the peace and the freedom? What were the Indians doing pr right then? And make two chronologies. Mm. That's my story. Two chronologies, side by side. As the Indians lose more and more, the Mennonites sink their roots more and more. And then thank God, where nothing dwelt but beasts of prey, uh, men as wild as, uh, as, as they, God plants his people there and gives them, builds them towns and cities there. That's what Isaac Watts wrote. Really? Yeah. I've never heard that before either. Well, no. I wrote my oh. thesis on him, Nadi, and that's how I got that. Whoa. <laughs> mm. but, wow. wow. So what this I is... did was mm. I went back to 1644 when Hans Stauffer, mm. whose daughter came to and mm. came to bought the land where I live. Hans Stauffer was born and where, when William Penn was born, and I take their stories side by side, mm. side by side, no matter how difficult or abstruse it gets, I say what happened that year or that year or that decade, mm. and uh, I follow that. And when I get to the end of it, I have a different view of, uh, in other words, so God doesn't care for the Jebusites, huh? Doesn't care for the people that uh, Israel has chases off of Zion. And now we s sit there and sing Sunday after Sunday, and we're marching to Zion. It, our songs abound, and they're still mourning the loss of their land in Oklahoma. Hmm. And I had to rethink. I don't care. I don't care if it's radical or conservative or what it is. I don't care. Hmm. Just know the story and relate to people. Hmm. So when I had to move uh, last month into a retirement home off of that land, hmm. the last person who would be with me as we walked down to the creek and sat there for and talked was a uh, Lenape Indian from Brattleboro. Really? Uh, from uh, from uh, uh, Bartlesville. Yeah. Wow. But anyway, um, hmm. in, 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 decide, in, in taking that naive narrative instead of mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a history of ideas or whatever, a macro culture, in taking my parochial uh, little local narrative and following it uh, just like an Amishman would mm. and following it and what will it tell me? That's my book. Mm. Mm. What will it, And what it tells me is that when William Penn came the first time to Pennsylvania, he came in 1682. He got the land in 1681. And you know why he got it? Because his, the king owed his family a debt, and you know what that debt was for? Mm -hmm. A great military victory between England and Holland, the Battle of Lowestoft. But anyhow. Right. Interesting. So that money, and, and William Penn, when the Quakers were so persecuted in England, William Penn's dad was an admiral, admiral who was buddy with Charles II. Oh, and Charles cool. II's brother James of York, who then became the king, they yeah, were buddies. Yeah. They were social buddies. And what William Penn's dad did, whose name was also William Penn, okay. uh, the first, uh, <clears throat> after the Battle of Lowestoft, mm -hmm. they'd spent a lot of money to fire a lot of cannons and defeat. Mm -hmm. The king owed a lot of money, and William Penn's dad paid it for him. So the king owed William Penn a lot of money, mm -hmm. never paid it. And w William Penn got a bright idea as a Quaker. He said, our people are so persecuted, there's land over there in New Jersey. There's land west of the Delaware. Maybe the king would give, give me that instead of paying off the debt. Hmm. He tried it with the king. The king said, yeah. He gave him the biggest spot of land anybody ever got, free. <laughs> In 1681. And huh. on it, it says this on the document. With special reference to the Battle of Lowestoft. That's why I'm giving you this land, because your dad hmm. had a battle 
in the in the, in the English Channel and in the North Sea and won it for me is basically what he's saying. Mm -hmm. So William Penn got Pennsylvania for, for, because his, the king owed his dad a military debt. And then, but William Penn knows Mennonites because mm -hmm. he's traveled to Europe and he's worshipped with them. Sophisticated Dutch, countrified uh, uh, Palatines, mm -hmm. and he knows the Swiss. And then he finally comes over here himself. He gets the land in 1681. He comes in 1682. And we have the date of 1683 when an Indian remembers sitting down in the woods with William Penn and what, what they did, what they said, and made friendship that they thought would be forever, which lasted 70 years. And then it burst into flame. Mm -hmm. And I talk about that that narrative all the way through there, and think, and I again and again quote what the Indians said at key points, mm -hmm. as they were in the year seventeen hundred and nine when William Penn wrote that letter, and my ancestors Clemens has arrived. That year, the boy that had heard William Penn talk, love for Indians in 1683 in the woods of Perkesy mm. has left and is out at the next, at the Schuylkill and the Susquehanna. And, uh, so you're saying that person had already been pushed out? He left. He left. Okay. Because there were so many people coming in. Yeah. Now he wasn't driven, he wasn't driven out at that point. Okay. Economically, yes. Now that, that young boy, who was just mm. a boy, listening to William Penn, never forgot that. He died in the 1740s, mm. and he became the chief of our Indians, the Lenapes. Mm. They didn't use the word chief. Uh, I, forget. I don't know what word they used. But here's the thing. First, he went to the school hill. Then he went to the Susquehanna. Mm. Then their people went to the Ohio. Every time the whites came right after them, took their land, and only when the Indians finally realized there was no way out of this, they were going to have nothing, is when they attacked. And that's when the Mennonites tell the story, when the attacks start. Hmm. What, okay. So my head is spinning a little bit sure. because I've just never heard any, so was any of this. Right? Why were the Mennonites going along with this? Was it – we're just – not really going to pay attention to what's happening or they they were genuinely ignorant of these things do we know at all and then like you said we start hearing the stories much later when the indians start attacking for example i mean that, that those are the only stories i've heard at least can you speak into that at all well look the lenapes after the swedes and the dutch came and the Br british took over in 1664 were so racked by uh, um, smallpox. Mm. It killed probably 80% of 20, 75 oh, or 80% wow. of them. So they were only a remnant. Mm. And, and, and they were really, uh, in terms of your vision of reality, insignificant. Mm. And they gave up. They were, so there was no relationship. There, yeah. there are exceptions. But the general picture is the remnant of the Lenapes were not even if the only problem you had with them was to give up, sign papers to give up more and more land. And they always did. And they were given gifts. They were given guns and they were given needles and uh, uh, tools and, and gunpowder and rum. And they were all the signs, sure, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. And their idea in in their brain and in their hearts was never that they, uh, when they started talking with the whites, it was always on the basis we're going to live together. Not like up in uh, New England or Virginia where there was blood. Mm -hmm. William Penn, they said, you're different. We're going to live together. Mm -hmm. And they both believed it. He did. And when the Indians would come back from time to time, to Philadelphia to, in order to negotiate. And I'll, I'll mention a couple of reasons why they did. They would always talk about love, love. <laughs> we have more talk from the Indians about love than anything about Mennon than anything the Mennonites left on record. Hmm. 
But they did. But like in the book of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, mm -hmm. when David wanted the Jebusite hill of Zion, he said, I'll have it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And he drove them away, and they are no longer part of the story. And the Lampies were not part of our story. Didn't, so God didn't care about them. He had to give us this land, and that was where God was interested. Mm -hmm. was, and thank you, God, every time at Harvest Home and uh, uh, about how when we came here, we're in the prison. And one Indian said, one of Mennonite ministers said, and I saw this or dreamed I saw it, but I think I saw it on YouTube. He was showing some German tourists mm -hmm. some land in Lancaster County blooming with there's nothing like Lancaster County hardly anywhere. He said, I don't know if you can talk Pennsylvania Dutch or I, not. I can't. No. Well, he said in Pennsylvania Dutch to these Indian tourists, he said, now, now when we came here, there was nothing here. Hmm. There were Indians living there. The, the creek was named Conestoga and hmm. Pequay and Chil Chickies hmm. and Allegheny. The names came from before, but he said there was nothing here. It doesn't even figure in your imagination. Mm -hmm. Well, this bugged me like it bugged Conrad Greville to start thinking who was paying for his scholarship at the <laughs> University of Paris. Mm -hmm. Whose land did I am I enjoying so much? And and uh, on the, my wife put the initials of our ownership of our land all around her. Our, our frock tour in our living room, and not, it started with WP, 1684, when he bought it from the Indians, William Penn. And then all the Olivers and Landises and Martins and all the names of the Ruths and so forth, but nothing about what was before for who know how many thousand years. Mm -hmm. It was not even if, I didn't have to think about that. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, <clears throat> well, the Indians never forgot. They're 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 still sad, uh, and that's a whole other story. But uh, mm. uh, it's important for me to 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 uh, to report that <clears throat> when the Indians left, uh, I say Indians, and they they use the word too. When they they first moved from the Perkiomen where I lived. Uh, and the Delaware, which is the eastern border, they moved to the next big river, which was uh, the Schoolkill. Mm. And along the Schoolkill, and along that general area, they had two, uh, or they had about three pockets left: the Lehigh that came down from the north, uh, the Schoolkill, the brandy wine, and the Tulpahock. Now, those are all Indian names. Mm. So there were pockets of Indians left there. The Quakers finessed the Indians out of Brandywine, businessmen, speculators. Uh, other Palatines that were not Anabaptists came down. They weren't happy in the Hudson River and took over Tulpahocken. The Indians protested. So they moved out to the Susquehanna and they lived there. And then the white people came along and bought that land and they found that they couldn't stay there either. And then they went to the Ohio and they found they couldn't stand there, stand there either. And I read what the secretaries wrote. I mean, the, this was not original with me. Uh, university mm -hmm. scholars had been at this papers long before I ever even dreamed of them. But I went and read them myself from my personal interest level. And here was Sassoon, this boy that sat and heard William Penn talk, and never forgot it. Mm -hmm. And he came back, for instance, from the, uh, from the uh, uh, school girl and said, we have a question in 1715, the first time he came as chief. He said, uh, how come some years we got good prices for our furs? Beaver were almost gone by then. Mm -hmm. But some next year we come and it's no... We don't understand that. That doesn't seem fair to us. Mm. Well, they said, you have to think like they think in Europe. Styles change. And when there's a fad on for beaver, that's when you get good prices. And when there isn't, you don't. You got to think like that. Well, you couldn't get that through Illinois' head. Mm. 
So what they did was, here, here are some biscuits and some rum and some gunpowder. We love you. So, oh, thank you very much. They went on a spree with the rum and went home again. That's 1715. Then the next time they come back, they have questions about land. They said, you never paid for this uh, certain land. Oh, yes, we did. Uh, and so what, William Penn's secretary went to the archives and he pulled out a whole bunch of deeds, all the, with these Indian signatures on them, these scratchings. And he showed them to him. Well, yeah, they recognize him. So he said, you, you don't own any land anymore. They thought they could come and dig tahoes and kill deer and, and live there with them. Well, that was a dream. So they just kept moving and moving and moving. And so what William Penn's secretary did in 1718 was he drew up, he, he, he legal procedure, drew up a quit claim. That was a legal document in which the Indians signed their names, we own nothing here. And he gave them more to eat and more, and they finally signed that too. Uh, and uh, that didn't settle things because that was in the white people's minds. Mm -hmm. Legal doc, they made promises in their heads and they never forgot them. And to them, that was more uh, this writing on a feather on a paper, by the way, they called William Penn Feather. Penn. Mm -hmm. so they, so they called, their name was, him for, was Feather <laughs> in their language. Mm -hmm. So they have to, the, the white people said, now you've got to learn to think like we think. Mm -hmm. And I put in my book a document in which Penn's secretary sits down with Sassoonan and for, it must have been an hour or so, spelled out the rationale. He says, now you have to think like this. Mm -hmm. Well, the Indians never did it get through their heads. Mm -hmm. fair, what's fair is fair, no matter if you write it with a feather, with a goose quill, on leather or anything, mm -hmm. that's not as, as real as the promise that we made that we will always be friends and have love with each other. So I go in my book, I find mm -hmm. those words of love, and I write them in that book so that whoever bothers to read that book will at least see that mm -hmm. and not have just these vague ideas in their heads mm -hmm. of the Indians disappearing. They disappeared with regret wherever they moved, mm -hmm. and they still have that regret. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing a lot of people hearing this haven't, haven't heard this story, don't know this at all, and aren't familiar with what the Mennonites, like our ancestors, the process we of, were, of where this came, comes from. We were from. no worse than others. The Mennonites were no worse and sometimes no, better. Right. But, but, but we pay, paid no attention to that uh, drama. And, and it sounds more like an issue of perhaps ignorance or uh, who knows. But well... Sure, when it's savages that just shoot squirrels and uh, mm. and uh, and are drunk a lot mm. and are poor and barely living, mm. you, you know, is that what God wants? God, God builds a beautiful country here and gave it to us. That's mm. our dream. That's yeah. our rhetoric. Mm. There, there is, you know, the the whole idea of manifest destiny and and some of that. Yeah, like, yeah that's related. This related where it's like, oh, see this wonderful thing we were given while not quite maybe realizing. But to, like, today yet, if you talk to a lot of evangelical Mennonites, mm -hmm. if you raise this kind of concern, this visceral con after all, they say, who have you been listening to? This? That's wokeism. Yeah, That's was, communism. I'm, I was going to say that I can about guess to within a high degree of accuracy, the comments and feedback we'll get when we publish this, right? I, now I that means that. we're we're still going to publish it, but people are going to say, "Oh, that's just you. You've been drinking the the liberal Kool Aid yeah. or something crazy." You know, they're going to say that, right? I know that, mm -hmm. and I can't uh, go. With, uh, I can't uh, do anything about that <laughs> except to lay on record. And I know that people who are curious enough mm -hmm. will think. Well, so, so I'd like to to drill in on that a bit so as we hear this story get this is this is new for me right i haven't heard this story what should our response be i'm not there yet hmm. i'm still drinking in the story 
Hmm. And I think their response will take shape in the people's consciousness as they think about it. And yeah, it will be yeah. a gradual process. Like a shape, almost like a shaping process as, as we dwell with the story. And it will find ponder. form. It will find mm -hmm. form. Mm -hmm. I cannot administer or strategize that form. There are mm -hmm. all kinds of groups getting together mm -hmm. and seminarizing about it and strategizing. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I'm against them at all, mm -hmm. except that that's not where I am emotionally. I had to first understand the story and get some feeling about it. And th out of that, you know, when I was 92, I lived, a, I lived my life along a creek. I decided I wanted to find out where that creek started. It was mm. high time. Mm. And it sure it was at Perkasie where Sassoon and Heard, because uh, uh, I live along the Perkyoman Creek branch of it. And when I got to the source of that creek, I looked for a, a, a narrowing rivulet. I was looking for a narrative uh, specificity that I could follow. Uh -huh. And I want to see where it bubbled out of the ground, mm -hmm. you know, just like I wanted to go to see Condra Greville's letter, you know. Yeah. I wanted to go to the source. And when I got there, I found that it was not a matter of bubbling out of a specific, it was seeping up and gathering. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is how things gather in the human consciousness. It seeps up mm -hmm. and then it takes form. Mm -hmm. And then someone gives it a name. And, and, and a language, and then and it becomes concepts in our minds mm -hmm. and, and takes, uh, the, <clears throat> it becomes an algorithm which then becomes a, a post, it becomes a thing yeah. somewhere, mm -hmm. takes form. And uh, mm -hmm. this is happening in our country. And by the way, the people that are making the most noise about uh, helping the Indians can be very annoying to me. <laughs> Mm. Uh, they're so very self-righteous. You can be a fundamentalist on the left as well as on the right. Mm. And to me, it's in my generation, I'm hearing the story, I'm getting the feeling. And maybe, when I talk like this, people ask me the same questions. You say, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know one thing. I have struck up a relationship and a conversation with, with them. And that I'm just a teeny part of that conversation. Are there, People are doing it all over, and something will happen. We'll, we'll cross thresholds of feeling, and in the meantime, we'll argue each other out of nowhere. So I'm wondering how, say, a podcast like this can help inspire our audience to be more aware of our story, our history. And when I say that, I, I mean not just the parts that we like. No. Right, right. Could you speak into that? Like, what would you like to see there? Well, look, I did what I could by putting it down on paper and letting you hear Sassoonan's words, mm -hmm. not just the, the victorious uh, uh, conqueror's interpretation of history. Mm -hmm. I, and I ask myself, what would Jesus, what, what mm -hmm. does Jesus in me uh, must respect? Mm -hmm. Hmm. The Samaritan. And in the Old Testament, really, the Jebus, David says, I want Zion. I'm sorry. They hmm. say you can't have a Zion because uh, that's where they keep the lame and the blind up there. It's, geez. And David is quoted by the righteous writer, I hate the lame and the blind. I'm going to get rid of them and I will. Hmm. And then, and more seriously, and here you have to be an adult. The writer of the Chronicles or Kings, I forget which, says, quotes God referring to Zion and says, my name shall be there. Mm -hmm. And now we are all marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful to Zion. And the Jebusites are nothing but roadkill. They're out of the way. Mm -hmm. And I'm not there. I don't think Jesus was there. Because when Jesus came to the temple at Zion, Mm -hmm. He kicked out the establishment business people. <laughs> yeah. And who came in? The lame and the blind. Oh, wow. That's mm -hmm. the logic mm -hmm. of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The upside down kingdom, I guess yeah. you could yeah. say, you know, yeah. Yeah. kingdom logic. Yeah. And so that my mm -hmm. adventure into this was not as an expert or a historian <sighs> or anything. It's simply uh, some, 
When I told the story uh, a year or two ago, a man came up to me afterward. I'm sure most people were bemused by my talk. But mm -hmm. One man came up and said, you know, this is the first time I felt this viscerally. He said. Mm -hmm. So as we wrap this story up, what is something you would like to leave with the next generation? Uh, maybe a word of advice or... Yeah, anything really that you would like to leave them to perhaps help guard against the errors of the past. To be honest, uh, and this is not false humility, I don't feel much wisdom on this. I just feel curiosity and a willingness to to uh, to uh, hear out uh, my story, uh, the story that I had to search for as an amateur uh, let me tell you a closing story that I tell in, at the end of my book. Uh, this was told to me by a man named Marvin Craker, who is from Russian Mennonite background, who was with the uh, Indians, uh, I forget the which Indians, out in Oklahoma also. And he told me this story. He said, uh, they used to tell this story, that in the Cherokee land rush, uh, somebody shot off a gun, and then you could write, write, race and plant your stake, and you could be a stake, uh, you could, what they call it. Uh, anyway, that could be your homestead. Mm. Mennonites lined up with the land rush, mm. and they took off at the crack of a gun. And one Mennonite, there was a story that came down of one Mennonite family. The man drove the horses, and the, the wife sat in the wagon with the stake. She was going to plant it when he picked out a place. And he raced in there, free land, you know, mm. Cherokee land, Indian land. Raced in there, free land, finally found the spot and turned around to his wife. This is it. Whoops. She had bounced out of the wagon somewhere back. He had to go back and find her. And where she landed, she put the stake. And that was the Mennonite homestead. You could tell that story as a Mennonite quilting and everybody would be entertained. How God, how mm -hmm. God leads. Mm -hmm. Tell that story to a indigenous person. Is it funny? Mm -hmm. How about looking at it from, that's all I did in the book. I tried to look at it from both mm -hmm. sides. Mm -hmm. That's all I could do. That's all I've done. Wish I'd have done a better job. Whew. Yeah. I just want to thank you for the effort you put in to telling this story. And that can be the challenge of history, I guess, is there are sometimes... Not, a, there's, not, not necessarily popular. Right. There's stories sometimes that, that we don't like, you know, and, oh, I, I don't really want to hear that, or I don't want to have to think about that. And, That's how our church got started. People were saying things don't make sense here. Mm-hmm. Mm we we got Conrad said use the word check with the word go mm -hmm. go with it and form a church out of that mm -hmm. think think those things yeah anyway thanks for listening to this episode with John Ruth if you found this interesting you might want to watch this episode we did with John Roth who explains some of the beginnings of early Anabaptism and you can find that link down in the description below. All our content is over on our website at anabaptistperspectives.org. And you can also sign up to our monthly email newsletter there as well. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.